Imagine we had a container with an infinite amount of saturated refrigerant, and this refrigerant was both non-toxic and environmentally friendly. If we were to connect the container to the inlet of a compressor, we could control the pressure inside the container to a desired set point. Since the refrigerant is saturated, by adjusting the pressure, we will also change the temperature that the refrigerant boils. This is great news because it means that we can select a compressor that can manipulate the pressure to the point where the refrigerant is at a temperature that is desirable to cool something. Because our refrigerant is non-hazardous, the discharge from the compressor can be directly to the atmosphere. Now that we have an infinite supply of saturated liquid refrigerant at a desired low temperature, we can simply pipe the refrigerant from our container to a heat exchanger where cooling is desired. As the saturated liquid absorbs heat from another substance inside the heat exchanger, it will cause the refrigerant to boil, which will occur at a constant temperature equal to the temperature inside the container. The refrigerant vapor generated is non-hazardous, so as it leaves the heat exchanger, we can simply vent it to the atmosphere. This is a form of refrigeration. Unfortunately, many of the assumptions in this example are quite problematic. First, there is no such thing as an infinite container. Second, even if there was a refrigerant that is completely non-toxic and environmentally friendly, no refrigerant is free. So venting directly to the atmosphere is unacceptable. So what can we do? Let's solve the problem one step at a time. Instead of venting vapor from the evaporator to the atmosphere, let's install a pipe that connects to the outlet of the evaporator back to the original container. The vapor will enter the container and then pass through the suction of the compressor. We still have the issue of the compressor discharge. Our current configuration has our system discharging to the atmosphere. Instead of doing that, let's employ a second heat exchanger that connects to the outlet of the compressor. Because the refrigerant leaving the compressor is superheated vapor, we will be able to cool and condense the vapor if we have a cooler substance to exchange heat with. If we pass cool ambient air through the heat exchanger, the heat in the refrigerant vapor will be rejected into the air. This will cause the air temperature to increase while the superheated vapor is cooled and then condensed into a saturated liquid. This has not solved our problem because we still have refrigerant venting directly to the atmosphere. However, by employing the second heat exchanger, we were able to change the state of the refrigerant at the point of discharge from vapor to liquid. Since the liquid leaving the second heat exchanger is at a higher pressure than the original container, we can pipe the liquid back into the container. By placing an obstruction in the pipe, which we will call an expansion device, the refrigerant entering the container will be at the container pressure we no longer have any refrigerant venting to the atmosphere. As a final step to simplify our system, we can remove our original container altogether. Since our refrigeration system is a cycle, we don't need a container at all. All of the refrigerant that is boiled in the first heat exchanger is compressed, then condensed in the second heat exchanger, and finally supplied back to the first heat exchanger through an expansion device. This is a vapor compression refrigeration system. With this depiction in mind, a vapor compression system achieves refrigeration by manipulating the pressure of a refrigerant to reduce the temperature of the refrigerant in order to achieve a desired lower temperature in another substance. One of the great things about the refrigeration cycle is that each component name tells you what's happening to the refrigerant inside the system. I like to make sure someone new to learning about refrigeration knows this. So when we start discussing an evaporator, um, someone might be getting confused, not remembering what's happening. Well, just remember that's where the refrigerant is evaporating. Same with the condenser. That is where the refrigerant will be condensed. Um, compressor, expansion valve, you can apply that to, to any of them and really understand what's going on. Second thing I like to remind new students to refrigeration about is that, that I like to tell them to think of heat as a thing, um, like a noun. It's not, um, don't, don't think of heat as some like nebulous concept, but it's a thing and it's a thing that we're gonna be moving around as we move around our cycle. When drawing a refrigeration cycle, because it's a cycle, we really can start from any component. So I'll start from where it's cold. The evaporator is probably the, the most recognizable component to a lot of people. So 
I'm going to start by drawing our, our evaporator. Okay. Um, and what is the evaporator really? It's a, it's a heat exchanger. Often, if it's an air point evaporator, it'll have fans on it, right? Blowing air over some product. Let's, uh, in uh, this case, I'll say it's cooling uh, uh, in a factory or a food processing facility that packages oranges, let's say. That orange has heat, which um, goes into the evaporator, causing the ammonia in the evaporator to boil, okay? The ammonia entered the evaporator as a, as a low temperature, um, low pressure, low temperature, low pressure liquid. And because of the heat that got added to the evaporator from the orange in this case, it exits the evaporator. It exits the evaporator as a, still a low temperature, still low pressure, but now it's a vapor. Because when a substance changes from liquid to vapor, there is no change in temperature. Technically, there is a pressure drop through the evaporator, but it's minimal and designed to be minimized so that we can ignore that and say it occurs at a constant pressure. So our flow is like this. So from the evaporator, what do we do with this low pressure vapor? Well, we need to recompress it. So we'll take it up to a, uh, a compressor, which I'm gonna draw here. Uh, like a screw compressor. All right, here's our compressor and I'll put arrow markers so we know which way we're going. So this low temperature, low pressure vapor enters the compressor and it's gonna exit the compressor as a now high temperature, high temperature, high pressure, still a vapor. Remember, compressors hate liquids. No liquid should be going through the compressor. That's not um, that's not as designed if that's that's happening. But now we've taken our our pressure, our vapor, squeezed it down, and that process of squeezing it down, the pressure increased, and the temperature also increased. It's worth pointing out that this compressor requires a lot of energy. So I'm going to draw um, this as though it's got a plug on the end. Of course, it's not required, but that's my sign for energy, which means it's expensive. All right, it's expensive to run this machine. It's going to have a lot of horsepower. So we leave the compressor as a high temperature, high pressure vapor. What are we gonna do with that? Well, we're gonna send it through a second heat exchanger, uh, which we call a condenser. Just like the evaporator, this too is exchanging heat. The major difference is the direction of the heat transfer. In the evaporator, the heat from our orange was absorbed into the ammonia in the evaporator. Here in, at the condenser, we're not gonna absorb heat, we're gonna reject the heat. Now where are we gonna reject the heat? Well, in most cases, we reject it to atmosphere. So I'll just draw some clouds and a couple of birds flying to, to give an impression of the atmosphere. We're just sending that heat to a place where it can do no harm. Oftentimes, most of the time, that is uh, the ambient conditions out, outside. Okay, the condenser also, we use fans, often water pumps as well, evaporative condensers to help um, expedite that heat exchange process. And so a high temperature, high pressure vapor enters the condenser, but it leaves as still a high temp and still high pressure. But as the name rightly says, it leaves condensed as a liquid. So now we have a high temperature, high pressure liquid. All right, we still haven't finished our cycle. So what do we do? Well, we just got one piece left. So to get our high temperature, high pressure liquid back to a low temperature, low pressure liquid that we need to enter the evaporator, all we have to do is add an expansion device. And I'm gonna draw it as a valve, which is oftentimes what you see in a refrigeration application, but there are different types of expansion devices. And what does this expansion device do? Well, really it's just an obstruction in the piping that um, throttles the flow as it passes through that valve, which causes the pressure to drop. And because we know pressure and temperature are related, as the pressure drops, so will the temperature. So that when we cross that, pass through the expansion valve, we drop back to our original starting point as a low temperature, low pressure liquid. 
So we have drawn our cycle. Uh, make sure I put all my arrows on here. And every refrigeration professional should be able to draw something just like this. But I wanna add a little bit more to this um, just um, by way of help. First of all, I wanna point out that if I divide my cycle in half horizontally, everything above the orange line is on the high side, what we like to call the high side. And that's referring to the pressure. So everything here is high pressure. Therefore, everything below the line is gonna be low pressure, All right? So often we'll talk about the high side, and the low side, diagrammatically, you can see that. I get a new color, I divide the system in half vertically, like this, everything on this side of my pink dotted line is a vapor. And everything on this side of my pink line is a liquid. All right, so that's another way to look at the system. We were dealing with different, um, different pressure quadrants and different liquid vapor quadrants. Um, remember, all of this happens in a cycle. I've drawn the arrows here, but this goes on infinitely. Theoretically, we don't lose any refrigerant due to leaks or any other reason, and this will just go on and on and on. The final thing I wanna point out before finishing um, this lesson is that during the compression process, process of squeezing the vapor down, a lot of heat is generated. And that heat we call the heat of compression. Okay, so that electricity as it gets converted to mechanical energy, there's a lot of heat generated. We also absorb heat in our evaporator. So we have heat added here and here. Okay, that dotted region is the sum of all the heat that gets added to our refrigerant. I just point that out because the condenser needs to be sized big enough so they can reject not only the heat that was absorbed in the evaporator, but also the heat of compression, which can be as much as 25% of the evaporator heat. So let's just say that the evaporator absorbed 100 uh, BTUs of heat. Um, if the heat of compression is 25% of that, that would be 25 BTUs, which means how much heat would the condenser have to reject? 125 BTUs. So that's a, that's a, summary of the refrigeration cycle.